Hey everybody, thanks for coming back. We now have a very exciting session where uh, my brother and then other people will tell you about things they discussed in the breakout sessions. Uh, so there were five breakout sessions. We, have, we had about 20 minutes, we're running about five minutes late, so everyone will take less than four minutes. I will be cutting them off. Um, and we'll start with AI innovation commercialization. Um, my brother will tell you what they discussed. Thanks. Thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> uh, so we had a great breakout session um, in, uh, at lunch for AI innovation and commercialization. And one of the major topics that I'll tell you about we, that we sort of synthesize everything around is there is a, a big difference in this field right now between having a technology and having a product. Right, so I don't know what the composition of the group and the audience is, but I imagine many of you are Hopkins faculty members, students, graduate students, affiliates, some entrepreneurs as well. And um, I'm sure all the entrepreneurs in here know in general, it is always the case that there's a difference between a cool technology and a good product. In AI, in healthcare in particular, I think that is even more uh, the case than it normally is. So we talked about uh, a bunch of different uh, issues in which this arises or ways in which this arises. One is, uh, first of all, whether the AI that is being developed is a product by itself or an enabler. And, you know, there are many business models for selling things into healthcare systems right now that require a device. You know, you could buy a CT scanner, you can, uh, you can buy a, uh, you know, an x-ray machine, you can buy anything in the radiology department, you can buy cardiac monitoring equipment, and all of those things can have software in them, but you're ultimately paying for the device. There's not yet, and everybody understands how to price those things. Uh, we had some good comments from people on the corporate venture capital side that we have all been acclimated in this world to basically think that software should be free. So the problem is when you're developing this perfect uh, cardiac monitor with built-in AI so that you can alert the nurses or the physicians on call when there's an adverse event, um, that just means that your cardiac monitor got fancier. It does not mean that anyone wants to pay you for your algorithm. Um, and so this was one of the themes that, that ran through our lunch was, as an AI uh, developer, you have to decide if you are you know, trying to build an AI product or if you're trying to build something that enables another product. And that product could be a device. It also could be a product that enables better billing or better back office, uh, back end systems in the hospital. All of which ultimately you're paying for that core function that hospitals already know how to price and to deliver, not necessarily paying for um, the AI. Another um, theme that we discussed in uh, AI, which I'm sure has come up today and will come up is for anybody who's developing algorithms is, um, what is the role of data in the product? And then ultimately, whose data is it and who owns that data? And whether the people who own that data should be profiting from the product? And this is a large scale kind of policy decision. You know, everybody in this room is probably has their data making Gmail and Google a better product for all the rest of us. And as far as I know, I haven't gotten a check from Google to thank them, from them to thank me for all the data I've contributed. But this is a, a much more substantive issue in healthcare when you have private records and they're very valuable and have been monetized um, as such. Um, so I only have three minutes and I haven't been keeping time. So I'm going to assume that I'm about at the end of that, uh, what the one thing that was very clear from our discussion was that even though a lot of these issues are ongoing for everybody in the industry and everybody all across the globe is, is, um, is trying to figure these things out, we do have at Hopkins a bunch of support structures that can help entrepreneurs, scientists, faculty members to navigate part of this landscape at least as well as it can be navigated right now. And so, you know, there's JHTV on campus here. Uh, JHTV has an accelerator program. They can help with tech transfer. They can help do uh, corporate partnerships and co-development. They have mentorship, advice, EIRs. And so, you know, although um, there's no one right answer, there, the good thing is within Hopkins at least, we have a good community and a good support structure to help us collectively think through how to monetize these things, how to productize them, and how to make ultimately value for the patients and the doctors who are the end users of these things. So that was our session. I hope that was okay. <laughs> Good. You somehow. Thank you for that. You miraculously timed yourself for exactly four minutes to a second. So, Arch and I, hopefully you can do exactly the same. Okay. So, 
Thank you. So our breakout session was on fairness, ethics, and privacy. Uh, we had a really energy, energetic and um, vigorous discussion about many of these issues, and we took a very broad perspective on each of them. So we were initially tasked with trying to understand what are the challenges in this space, as well as what are some of the opportunities. Um, of how to bring AI into medicine. And so our challenges that we identified were really based around three different themes. So the first was the, the idea of bias, right? So the, the idea that for certain subpopulations or certain patient characteristics, um, an AI algorithm might not be make a good decision for them. So this could be a variety of factors. This could be that the data that you essentially train the algorithm for, or train the algorithm on, was acquired from a different, perhaps overrepresented segment of the population. Um, and another issue is you are typically training these algorithms to optimize something, right? Some objective function, and oftentimes the objective function can have implicit biases that you wouldn't recognize. Um, up front. So if your objective function has some term of minimizing cost, it might actually disadvantage certain patient populations because of that. Um, and so I think the idea of bias is a really important theme that needs to be addressed moving forward with AI and medicine. The second is, I think, a, a theme that you'll hear more about later from Brian is this idea of interpretability, right? So if we're depending on an AI algorithm to make decisions, essentially we want to understand why it's making those decisions and if those decisions are being made in a principled and ethical manner. And current state of the art, it's very difficult to tease that apart, and so that's another, another um, issue that should be addressed. And then I think the third broad challenge is um, not so much on the technical side, but more on the regulatory side. So how do we actually think about bringing um, these new, uh, very exciting techniques in AI into our current regulatory framework in order to, again, embed our own sense of human ethics and fairness and privacy into them? Um, so for example, um, who is responsible for determining whether or not an AI is fair. So we can make that decision based on if we have the same care standards for different demographics, you can make that distinction based on if you have the same care standards for uh, commiserate symptomatology, etc. But really there's a disconnect between the people developing these methods and these algorithms, so people with a very strong technical skill set, um, as well as, and a disconnect between them and people on the clinical side, as well as between just medicine in general and some of the social sciences. And so integrating those three, three seems to be an important thing to rely on moving forward. Um, and so one that led us into the more, I guess, optimistic side of our discussion, which is looking at the opportunities in this space. And so one opportunity is the idea of efficiency. And so just to make processes more efficient, so maybe more drugs come to market, more therapeutics are explored for different patient subtypes. Um, so AI can be used to streamline clinical trials, to speed up the process, to get things to market quickly. Um, it can be used to study post hoc uh, interactions between drugs, again, from clinical trials, so that some of these drugs can be used to benefit certain patient popula populations, um, as well as um, potentially AI will help us uh, just in terms of the technical contributions it brings to the space, so moving away from trying to characterize group differences and using that as a metric of success to the idea of bringing in um, out of sample generalization, so how do the algorithms perform on a patient basis and is this um, sort of perhaps it can increase the prevalence of these technologies in certain communities and equalize healthcare around. And then a final theme is the idea of fairness, again, on, is an opportunity space. And so thinking of these algorithms as data-driven processes, again, modulo sort of training and understanding how we're doing this, um, it can remove human biases from the equation. So if these are entirely data-driven algorithms, many times there are assumptions made by clinicians or by attending physicians based on patient characteristics that potentially are not equitable, and so an algorithm making some of these decisions could help, um, as well as bringing some of the new uh, medical innovations into impoverished regions or into demographics or geographic regions that are hard to target elsewhere. So it has the potential to be a good equalizer in that sense. I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Uh, next up is regulatory considerations that Nick is, I think, presenting. Oh, you guys will present together, maybe.
so my first name is Berkman and this is Nick Patrick. We are both from the FDA. So we led the discussion on uh, regulatory considerations. We talked about many topics, but I think we can summarize it under maybe three bullet points. One is algorithm comparisons and data set. Second is standardization. And the third is explainability or black box and how it affects uh, the uh, regulatory considerations. And in terms of uh, algorithm comp uh, comparisons and data sets, w one of the things that we talked about was the lack of common uh, standardized data sets where different algorithms can be compared on the same data set that would be useful from a regulatory standpoint as well as you know, many other uh, standpoints. Another uh, issue that we talked about is the use of phantoms in the uh, evaluation of uh, AI algorithms. So uh, one of the questions was, you know, if I try my algorithm on a phantom data set, you know, what would the FDA think about it? So it's a difficult, complex question, so it needs, I think, more discussion, but I think uh, it's a wordy uh, question uh, for uh, further discussion. Another question was about, uh, again, on data sets was uh, subsets. So I have an algorithm that I've shown works on a, um, you know, fairly large data set. But how do we decide what subsets to look at for performance and to see if there's any bias, if there's any part where the algorithm really doesn't work and I think one of the ideas was that this really has is an area where the clinical expertise or domain expertise and uh, you know technical expertise need to mesh up so that you know the uh, from clinical considerations one can hopefully decide what subgroups to uh, look at uh, and then another was multiple, uh, you know, data from multiple sites. More and more we see publications and results where it's shown that just data from one uh, clinical site is probably not enough because of the huge capacity of these networks to learn maybe some um, irrelevant facts. So uh, then we went on to standardization. Yeah, so standardization, I think there's a need, you know, this sort of need that the more we can have standard methods that are agreed upon by whether that's societies, industry, um, and, and entities that get together and say this is a, the approach that you should use for maybe you're doing reference standards or this is the, the approach you should do for data collection. Um, these are the types of things that the more there is those consensus around what are the methodologies you use, the much more straightforward it is for an agency to say, yeah, we recognize those standards, we ex expect people to utilize them, and as you utilize them, that becomes a more standardized approach there. I think st the other part of standardization is, is, as I think Berkman was hinting at, the type of data, or what are the subgroups for any particular use case that are really relevant to those tests, and we definitely want to make sure we have data on. There may be other ones that are important as well, but what are the ones that we really should be expecting to see for, you know, use case A for CT and lung versus mammography or some other places that are logical make sense from a clinical perspective and can we come together again to have a consensus on not necessarily where the data comes from but at least what the data we should be looking at when we do the assessment methodologies. And then another topic that we uh, talked about was interpretability or the uh, possible black box aspect of these algorithms and one analogy that was made was with respect to therapeutics sometimes you don't know how a drug uh, works but you still use it so uh, you know there was discussion that you know it will definitely affect the adoption of the uh, AI system and one idea was that maybe this could be used to some companies advantage you know if they show that their algorithm not only works but then is explainable and they go through the FDA with that explainability it might help the company in the uh, longer run so that's that's about it thank you Thanks. That was impressive. That was like a two-for-one deal. So you, you still fit it in about four minutes. Um, okay. Next, clinical perspectives. Kind of shifting gears over here. Alex is going to talk about that. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks uh, for inviting me to come uh, feed that session on clinical perspectives. 
Um, as someone who uh, plays around with this stuff analytically and also then tries to see its implementation, I'll try to focus more on the perspective side, most on application and what it might mean for physicians, although we certainly had a little bit of a technical discussion as well. I think starting um, really uh, from a clinical perspective, one immediately sees that the low-hanging fruit is the application of these techniques to medical imaging. But predominantly in the space of radiology and for pathology as we begin to consider digitization of certain parts of our workflow. And in that context, we thought that from a clinic, clinical perspective, we wanted to focus on where are the incremental gains to be made uh, by applying some of these technologies to improve workflows. So the natural thing that I think <clears throat> is uh, uh, kind of baked into how we do pathology, but also can be thought of in radiology as well, is screening systems. Not screening systems in the sense of screening colon cancer per se, but systems that screen material outside of the physician's review so that they can be more efficient. Now, with that discussion, of course, comes the question of if you make physicians more efficient, then will there be less of them, of course. Um, I think that the answer there is really uh, two-pronged. In academic medicine, I think a very different uh, kind of uh, thing might happen there, where physicians or faculty who are a physician scientist might have more time to dedicate towards other pursuits and generate value for an institution in a different way. In the private sector, from a clinical perspective, I can imagine that becoming more efficient uh, or we all thought becoming more efficient might, might not necessarily mean you have that many physicians there, or the reimbursement might be different. Um, the other thing we thought about from uh, the medical imaging side for a clinical perspective is support tools. So from me as a pathologist, if I'm looking at something on a microscope and I'm like, ah, I just don't know what this is, it'd be very helpful if I could just take a screenshot of it, put it into a search algorithm, not necessarily give me my answer, but convert my test from fill in the blank to multiple choice. I think that's sometimes very helpful, and we, I think that would be helpful in a lot of different aspects in uh, biomedical imaging. Um, moving on, we then talked, we talked briefly about uh, the clinical perspective in other data-rich side of uh, clinical medicine, which is laboratory medicine and telemetry in the ICU. We didn't have a lot of representation in, that, uh, in those fields in the room, but we certainly understand there's a lot of research going on in there, such as sepsis uh, prediction, cardiac arrhythmia prediction, cardiac arrest prediction, um, and very exciting field. There just wasn't a lot of... Uh, expertise in that uh, in the room to discuss that. Um, one aspect that we did have some expertise in the room that's kind of like laboratory medicine is genomics, kind of like the new laboratory medicine that's evolving over time, both uh, germline or hereditary assessments along with cancer or somatic mutation testing. So um, we think that there will be a lot of interest there in using machine learning techniques to better do phenotype genotype or sorry genotype to phenotype correlations with clinical implications there. As we look at more and more of the genome, it's going to be harder and harder for people to have memorized what every single chromosome, what every single genomic alterations mean. So we're going to need smart systems to help guide how to interpret genomic data. And likely those tools will come from things that how we similar to how we analyze human language actually. Um, and then, as a bridge to the final piece, which I think is the hardest part from a clinical perspective, is how would we bridge to epi epidemiological type studies? How would an EMR really empower population scale, real world data? And the, the, the obvious clinical implications there would be to be able to do large scale studies, best practice alerts, all these kind of things. But the major barriers there are, first of all, <laughs> um, they're not well-defined ontologies that characterize um, a, precisely each disease entity, and we have experts, some experts in the room here about ontology of diseases. Even if we have the ontology of diseases, the problem is that getting people to enter in that data into the EMR correctly on the front end rather than having to engineer that data on the back end is problematic and wastes time. So potentially smarter ways to capture data at the front line of clinical management so that the data comes in correctly in the front door. Uh, one analogy I thought was really interesting was on in the GRE testing, right? When you take the GRE, it keeps asking you questions and gets to where it needs to be without having to ask you all 50 questions. If there's something like that we could do in our data entry processes in medicine. So good session, just talking about the perspectives and such. Thanks for your attention.